I'm Dan Russell, a professor in the graduate program in acoustics at Penn State, and I'm a huge fan of acoustics books and apparatus from the 1800s. Today I'll be showcasing a modern version of Dvorak's 1878 acoustic propulsion apparatus, but I'm also going to try to reproduce his original demonstration. Greetings from the Acoustics and Sports Equipment Laboratory at the Graduate Program in Acoustics at the Pennsylvania State University. This apparatus here, which I've called an acoustic rocket, consists of a closed rectangular box driven at its lowest standing wave resonance by a configuration of four loudspeakers such that a pair of Christmas tree bulb ornaments, or Helmholtz resonators, will spin rapidly when the sound is turned up loud enough. I'd like to point out that I did not build this apparatus. I inherited it from Bob Kaolian when he retired from Penn State's Applied Research Lab. I believe this particular device may have been built by Jim Sabatier at the National Center for Physical Acoustics at the University of Mississippi. Izzy Rudnick used a similar resonator box and Christmas ornament apparatus during his fantastic demonstration performance at the 100th meeting of the Acoustical Society of America in 1988. The CD with his entire demonstration is available from the ASA store. Direction. And the same apparatus is often used for demonstrations by the physics faculty at the Naval Post Graduate School. This device is often called an acoustic radiometer, but I'm not sure that quite describes exactly what's going on. Here's what an actual acoustic radiometer looks like. This is from a video made in 1998 by Timothy Simmons when he was at the National Center for Physical Acoustics at the University of Mississippi. This device rotates due to radiation pressure from sound bouncing off the two pairs of plates. The change in momentum when the sound reflects from the smooth aluminum surface is greater than the change in momentum when the sound is absorbed by the dark gray foam side and the net change in momentum causes the radiometer to spin. So I'd like to show that this phenomenon has nothing to do with the box. There is nothing special about these resonators being placed inside the box. It's not a standing wave inside the box. It's making them rotate. Let's pull them out of the box and put them next to an adjacent loudspeaker, turn the volume up, and we'll find that it's the Helmholtz resonators themselves that are causing this rotation, not the result of a standing wave pattern inside this enclosure. The resonators are propelling themselves, causing them to rotate. The resonators don't have to be spherical Christmas tree balls. I built this simple example from two 12-ounce pop bottles glued to a thin piece of wood and suspended from a string. A 12-ounce pop bottle has a frequency of almost exactly 256 Hz, and this system rotates quite easily when driven by a loud 256 Hz signal. Whether balls or bottles, in a box or not, this demonstration was actually quite old. The effect was discovered simultaneously but independently in 1876 by an Austrian physicist by the name of Dvorak and the American Alfred Mayer. Dvorak presented a paper describing his acoustic repulsion apparatus before a meeting of the Royal Academy of Sciences in Vienna and published in the Annals of Physics and Chemistry in 1876. In 1877, he showed his apparatus to Rudolf Koenig, who informed him that the American Alfred Mayer had shown him an identical apparatus the summer before, and had presented his results before the New York Academy of Sciences with a summary of the presentation published in an 1876 Scientific American supplement. Dvorak published a second paper in 1877, describing his four resonator rotating wheel, and this paper was translated into English and published, along with a note of confirmation from Mayer, in the American Journal of the Sciences, the Scientific American, and Philosophical Magazine. The publication in Philosophical Magazine attracted the attention of Lord Rayleigh, who quickly dashed off a theoretical analysis for the very next issue, confirming that the difference in pressure between the inside and outside of the resonator would produce a net force appearing to push the resonator. Lord Rayleigh's short theoretical derivation was included in the second edition of Volume 2 of The Theory of Sound, where he referred to the apparatus as an acoustic rocket. In 1900 and 1901, Bergen Davis published a couple of papers exploring the behavior of an acoustic mill using small cylinders instead of Helmholtz resonators. Under normal conditions, a Helmholtz resonator acts like a mass spring system, with the air in the neck moving back and forth while the spring in the cavity alternately compresses and expands. However, when driven at very large amplitudes, the motion of the air in the neck is no longer simple oscillation. 
Air enters the resonator mouth around the edges from all directions, but exits as a high-velocity jet along the central axis. The steady-state time-averaged mass flow is zero, but the momentum has a net component directed along the central axis, causing the thrust. Tom Gabrielson has a nice video on his YouTube channel showing that air is drawn into the resonator along the mouth edges and is ejected as a jet from along the mouth axis. The jet is easily strong enough to blow out a burning match placed directly in front of the resonator mouth. High speed video at 1000 frames per second shows the flame pulsing slightly before being blown out. Afterward the smoke can be seen oscillating back and forth while being blown away from the resonator mouth. I tried to fill the resonator with smoke, hoping to clearly see the jet in a high speed video at 4500 frames per second, but I didn't have enough smoke for it to be clearly visible. However, the neck of this oscillator is 4 centimeters long, and if you look closely at the neck you can see smoke oscillating almost the entire length of the neck. The displacement is larger than the neck diameter, so this system is clearly operating in a nonlinear regime. Another way to observe the jet plume exiting the mouth of the resonator is to attach some thin thread fibers to the end of a stick and place them near the resonator mouth. Here we can see the 256 Hz pop bottle blow the threads away from its mouth opening. At 1000 frames per second, you can see the threads begin to pulse as the amplitude of the driving sound is increased and the jet is formed and the threads are blown away vigorously from the mouth opening. When the sound is turned off, the jet ceases and the threads fall back to their normal equilibrium positions. At 4,500 frames per second, the initial pulsing of the air outside the resonator mouth is clearly visible as the threads begin to oscillate prior to the full formation of the jet as the sound is increased even further. My first introduction to this demonstration came after reading Uno Ingard's book, Notes on Acoustics, where he describes the Christmas ball ornament apparatus. In this book and in a JASA paper called The Acoustic Circulation Effects and the Nonlinear Impedance of Orifices, Ingard discusses the nonlinear behavior leading to a transition from circulation around the orifice of the resonator to pulsations and the ejection of vortex rings and the formation of a jet as the intensity increases. So why did Dvorak call it acoustic repulsion? In 1876, Dvorak observed that a lightweight cylindrical resonator suspended in front of a tuning fork resonator box at the same frequency would be repelled. Here's my version of Dvorak's 1876 demonstration. I suspended a single bottle in front of a grid line background so we can observe it be pushed away from its equilibrium position because of the jet of air coming from its mouth. While creating an earlier version of this demonstration, I thought of another way to quantitatively measure the thrust. A resonator is placed on a pan balance and the balance is zeroed. A sound level meter records the sound pressure level and the amplitude of the sound is increased until the pan balance begins to read an excess mass resulting from the thrust pushing the resonator downward on the scale. I'll note that the sound level meter is approximately twice the distance from the loudspeaker compared to the resonator opening, so the sound pressure level at the mouth of the resonator is about 6 decibels higher than what the meter is reading. As the sound level increases, the amount of acoustic mass that's being measured also increases.
When the sound pressure level reaches about 114 decibels, the pair of resonators in the background acquires enough thrust to begin rotating. Plotting the excess mass on a log scale versus the corresponding sound pressure level shows a strong correlation between the two, and it agrees fairly well with an explanation of the forces being due to a second order acoustically induced pressure difference between the inside and outside of the resonator. Turning the sound off will cause the excess mass to drop to zero and the pair of resonators in the background will stop rotating. I was pretty proud of myself for coming up with the idea of measuring the thrust with a pan balance, only to discover during my literature review that this exact method had been published in a really nice 1992 paper in the American Journal of Physics, along with an updated version of Rayleigh's explanation of the force. But what I really wanted to do was to repeat the demonstration as performed by Dvorak and Mayer in 1878 when they caused a set of four resonators to rotate using the sound from a driven tuning fork resonator box. So I found four Christmas ball ornaments with a frequency of 384 hertz fashioned in acoustic mill wheels suspended by string in front of a 384 hertz tuning fork resonator box. I drove the fork with an electromagnetic coil and a tiny neodymium iron boron magnet in a feedback loop using the sound radiated by the fork as picked up by a small microphone. I was only able to produce about 114 decibels at the mouth of the tuning fork resonator box opening, which was barely enough to get the balls to rotate slightly, though it did demonstrate the repulsion effect. However, the torsional stiffness in the string suspension was large enough to prevent the acoustic resonator mill wheel from completing a single rotation, even though I was driving the fork as hard as I could. Using a 256 hertz tuning fork and resonator box, I was able to demonstrate the formation of a jet from the mouth of a 256 hertz pop bottle using the threads that I showed earlier. But the pair of pop bottles suspended from a string were too heavy and the sound pressure level created by the 256 hertz fork and resonator box were not loud enough to get them to rotate. So this system with the four balls hung from a string has a lot of torsional stiffness in it enough that I wasn't able to get it to rotate fully with the tuning fork. However, if I drive it with a much bigger loudspeaker and a much more powerful amplifier, I can get it to move fast enough to overcome that torsional stiffness and be able to rotate pretty well. Turning off the sound, the torsional stiffness, the elastic restoring force in this string will eventually bring the system to a halt and it will make it reverse direction as it tries to unwind. And if I let it reach the point where it stops and then begins to unwind, if I turn the sound back on again, the thrust from the Helmholtz resonators will be large enough that it can stop this reverse rotation and make it start rotating in the proper direction again. So that's acoustic propulsion. Dvorak's 1876 acoustic rocket, Meyer's 1878 acoustic mill wheel. I hope you enjoyed this demonstration. Thank you for watching.